Dairy Farm Monitor Project. Now there's some people in the room here that weren't involved with the project, so I thought I'd just touch on what it is and, and how it's been run. It's a three year project that um, basically involved uh, 30 farmers the first year, and the following year the same 29 um, came in. So it's basically the same farmers now have gone through two years of the three year project. Um, they are spread from Waruna all the way down the coast through to Denmark, so it's a wide spread. Spread in size as well, and a spread in um, enterprise type. So there's the, obviously one with irrigation um, dry land, it's pretty much 50 50, but the size, the herd structure, the calving dates, all those things, there's a mix, mixed bag amongst it. Uh, it's collected by consultants, um, so there's six consultants that collect the data off those 29 enterprises, and then it's actually validated. So basically, John takes the data puts it back through um, Department of Victoria, so it's all validated. Um, if there's any anomalies or things that look funny, we basically come back to the, the collator and the, you, know, you as the individual and just work through those couple of, um, if there's something that's way out of whack or doesn't look right. So it is, that's probably the, the real good thing is that it's, it's got that industry validation or you know that quality control. Um, and the purpose is, Obviously, as the individuals being in it, you um, you get that individual benchmarking and can track yourself, can track yourself and your progress. But it really is to give robust data to the industry, so to the WA industry, um, and then nationally. This program is it started off in Victoria nine years ago, and Cam's had a lot of experience with it over there. Um, but the other RDPs around the nation now run a similar program, so it's actually and by. Um, becoming, I suppose, nationally the same framework, you can confidently compare yourself against Queensland or Gippsland or Northern Victoria because you know the data has been collected and validated the same way. And that's where it leads into the dairy-based stuff that, uh, that Cam will get into. So, what have we found out? So to start with, I'll just look at, so the, you've all, or those that are in the program would have received the hard copy. Those that weren't, you can actually find the um, copy electronically on the website. If you just um, Google DFMP WA, it'll find it on the Dairy Australia website. So basically there's two years of data sitting there now. And that data is loaded up into Dairy Base as well. And one of the things of this, um, as we evolve our business um, knowledge and across the nation is to try and get this standardisation. So common language, you know, measuring it the same way, so we're all talking about the same thing. You know, it doesn't matter who's, whether it's a consultant on farm or a bank manager, whether you're in Victoria, whether you're in Tasmania or Western Australia, we've got this common language that we all understand when it comes to the finances. So could we just clarify that the farmers here who are in the Dairy Farm Monitor project, eventually their data will be in the dairy base? Yes. Well. Yep. Yeah. So, and if you're wanting to get onto dairy boat, which I won't steal too much of Cam's thunder now, but your, your individual data for 14, 15, we can actually load up. Um, it's down the pile, but if you're in a hurry for it, I can um, push it up the chain if need be. So, to start with, I just thought I'd look, reflect on the differences between the 13, 14 year and the 14, 15 year. So milk price, and that probably the other thing, just to reiterate to the people that weren't participating in it, the averages that I'm talking about here is the average of the data set. It's not the WA average. So the 29 that are in it is the average of them. Um, and they are largely skewed to being probably some of the better operators. So it's probably the average is above, I would say in my personal view, above the WA average. But just to make that point clear that the average is the data set average, not WA, even though I'll refer to it as WA average. I think it's a beautiful thing that on one page you've got the financial acumen outlaid. So at the top, you know, this is, so this is the WA average farm that doesn't exist anywhere. So it's saying, you know, cows for your income at the top, yeah, obviously cows by kilograms milk solid per cow gives you a total milk production by your average price of $7.09, um, which I think was 51.1 cents, gives you your income. That's milk income. So then the other income that adds, adding in there is any inventory change in terms of your feed and livestock, and then your livestock trading profit. Now in this, just to reiterate, the beef side of the enterprises has been removed. So it is totally dairy, dairy only. 
trying to isolate the dairy component of your business. So those businesses that have a significant beef portion, those animals, effectively, the tri livestock trading portfolio is your cull animals and then the young animals. So what happens is if you do sell them as day old, week old, whatever, that figure goes in, but if you're carrying them through, we take a weaned, um, an agreed weaned value, and we say even you're selling, effectively selling those animals to yourself at this price. So that's what we've done for the exercise. And that's consistent across all. So that we're getting that consistency is the main thing in benchmarking. And then other income is, if you have a bit of wind power or some other form of income that the farm legitimately derives. Diesel fuel. Diesel fuel. <laughs> so that drives your gross farm income. So then the next step is taking out your variable costs. So that's your herd costs, your feed, um, shed costs and your feed costs. That drives your gross margin. So when you're talking about gross margin, it's income, less variable costs. Then you've got your overheads, so you've got your cash overheads and then your non-cash, which is your imputed labour and your depreciation. Taking them off, that drives you, your EBIT or your net margin. So you're just getting those terminologies in sync. When people are talking about um, you know, cost of production and break even price and gross margins and whatnot, making sure that they're actually, one of the things we're about to embark on is improving that understanding of how these calculations are put together. So just remember, milk income, or income, and mostly milk drives your, your gross farm income, but gross farm income is that all that income, less your variable costs is your gross margin, less your overhead costs is your EBIT. And then from EBIT, that drives the ratios of return on asset, return on equity, um, and sorry I didn't touch on that, the net farm income, net farm income is your EBIT less your finance costs. So that's any interest and leasing costs are lumped in there. So leasing is not a feed cost, as it has been in some previous benchmarking exercises. It's actually, you're leasing that, you're choosing to lease rather than own the land, so it's considered a finance cost. Make sense? The beauty of that, it's all on one page. Um, how, do you, how do you calculate that depreciation in this program? Um, if you had a figure that you wanted to use on your, from your chart of accounts, you could use that, but generally it was 10%. And on the assets, the other thing probably to be aware of is the assets, uh, particularly on the land, if you're leasing the land, we've assumed a, basically a, a non-milking land value and a milking land value. So there's that, um, what would you say, standardisation across the collectors, data collectors on that. So, milk price is up. Other income up 5%, um, and that was worth another uh, 8 cents or $1.18 a kilo. Costs were neutral from year to year. So our variable cost, WA average, sitting at 3.82 kilos milk solids and uh, 2.26 overheads. So obviously if our milk price is up, our other income's up and our costs are neutral, we're heading in a positive direction. So on average, our EBIT was up 30, 36%. I'll go through the specifics of those in the next slide. And our ROA, which is a measure of our profitability, up 46%. And uh, that trended up to um, 6.7 as the average this year. On the physical side, this is the one area where we can sort of compare against the state. So the state for the year was up 7%. The participants within the DFMP production was up 11.6%. So basically, the, the guys that were in this, um, the participants have actually produced more than the state average. The season was drier, as we we're aware. I mean, that's a broad brush statement, but its um, rainfall was down 14% as an average. Um, means bugger all if you've got plenty of rain or you've got none at all. So, but as an average, that's what was last year. Herd size up 4% and per cow production up 6%. Labour efficiencies up, production efficiencies up. So the physical efficiencies as well as the financial efficiencies were improving. Joe? Yeah, just one question. With the uh, labour one, do you do some sort of allocation for the owner? Or? Yes, yep. So basically um, to calculate the, the cost of it, yep. the, if you're employing labour, it's whatever you're paying them. 
if you've got all the people within the family structure, you're actually valuing their time. So you go through and you actually say, whoever they are within the business, put their hours per week, and then there's a nominal value that's actually imputed in. And that's what drives this figure over here. You'll see it drives your, uh, your imputed labour. So on average, 110 grand is coming from imputed labour on the average dairy farm. So, into the financial indicators. Now I've broken these down basically by colour code. Um, but the whole purpose of this, and I've brought in a, a chart of accounts as well. One other thing that's going on is there's a Dairy Australia endorsed chart of accounts. So we're going to have a, a big mission to actually get this into the hands of you guys and the accountants. We had a session this morning with the accountants and bankers. Um, so that we're all on the same page when it comes to cost coding effectively. So we've got a standard structured um, chart of accounts. Um, hopefully we'll build the capacity with you, um, the people in your um, businesses. That's why I've asked the question who's doing it and what software you're using it. So if there's a common, my thought thinking is, if there's a niche group of people, well not a niche group, a, a chunk of people that are using AgriMaster that need to set up their chart of accounts because they haven't got it and they'd like to improve it, then we pull those together, bring in an AgriMaster person and, and do that training that way. There's no use me doing it with, when you've got AgriMaster experts and zero experts and things like that. So that's something I look to roll out um, soon. Obviously in terms of timing, a good time to change your chart of accounts is the financial year changeover. So that's obviously looming. But there is, again, that is on your website, um, and it will certainly for the data collectors make it a hell of a lot easier. You can just press the punt button and punch out financials straight away out of a system you're already recording for your bass anyway. And then when hopefully you go on to do, use Dairy Base yourself, it, the process just becomes easier and easier and quicker and quicker. And if it's quick and easy, I think people will do it. So it's structured, and you'll see that in your reports as well, the income is milk and other. So the average last year um, income, nearly 60 cents a litre, made up of 51 cents in the milk and, uh, and eight and a half cents in other. So our variable costs being our shed, herd and feed. So then within the feed, you've obviously got your subcategories of fertiliser, pasture uh, renovation, your hay and silage making, all those things that drive sitting in feed. So all that's outlined in the chart of accounts, what actually makes up feed. But there, your variable costs. So um, basically two cents for shed and herd costs and 24 cents is the average feed cost. So the average variable being basically 28 cents. Our overheads, as I said, the cash before is your, your labour, your rates, registration, insurance, all that sort of stuff. Um, 10 cents and your non-cash basically, so that's your imputed labour and your depreciation is about 6 cents. So overhead 16 cents, variables 28, so basically a 44 cent um, cost to produce the milk for a 60 cent income, which obviously leaves 16 cents EBIT or earnings for interest and tax. So the top 25. Now before, if I stick those up there, you'll just look at them. The top 25% are ranked purely on return on asset. So that is the financial measure. So it doesn't say if you're the top in the top 25% of, um, say, grazed pasture, you're in for that and then you're out for variable costs, you know, a shed cost or whatever. So it says, righto, who are the top 25 when it comes to return on assets and what do they actually do across these um, incomes and variable costs, uh, fixed costs, etc. So, slightly higher income, 4% more income at 61.5. Basically a little bit more in the milk and a little bit less in other, but pretty insignificant. 6% less variable cost. And basically shed and herd's the same, but a bit less feed costs. And if we drive down into the feed cost, you can actually understand why. Is it coming in fertiliser? Is it coming in hay and silage and whatnot? But just at a high level, it's saying that they are producing their feed cheaper. 19% overheads. So producing more milk with the same amount of overheads or producing the same amount of milk with less overheads, whichever way you want to look at it. They're more, they're diluting those overheads out. 
probably the, and it's basically a scent on each one. So all these these little things here drive 41% more EBIT. So it's the little things that are just adding up to drive the big one at the bottom. So that's EBIT rolling out forward. So the same numbers are coming through here. So the only thing to come off our EBIT to get our net farm income is our finance costs. So that's your interest and lease. Um, again, the top 25% are a little bit lower on, on those costs. So the net farm income is 11.5 cents and 19 cents for the top 25%. Driving a 6.7 return on asset or an 11.2 in the top 25 return on assets. Return on equity, 9 and 14.2. So as I said before, the average return on asset from last year to this year went from 4.6 to 9.7. Um, I think you've got the figures there about the EBITs um, have lifted. So in general, the 14, 15, good positive year. On the physical side, stocking rate. So this is cows per hectare, and it's cows per usable hectare, not cows per milking um, area. So this is on the total area that you're running, um, that you've dedicated to the dairy side. Again, if you've, your collector would have peeled off some beef allocation. Um, so if you had a 500 hectare farm and there's 100 hectares for beef, in the exercise you'd only have 400 hectares going into the, the data set for milk. So this, basically the top 25% have got a higher stocking rate. This is production per cow, so the top 25% are producing a bit more per cow. Multiply those two together, and the top 25% are driving 25% more milk per hectare out of their cows. Estimated grazing, again, this is over the whole usable area, so it's not just the milking platform, you'll have a much higher on your milking platform than what you will on your out blocks, I would say. So as uh, across the whole, they are basically 10% higher on their estimated grazing, and they're conserving a bit more feed as well. So you add these two together, it's um, 5.8 versus a, what's that, a 4, 5.3. So an extra half tonne across the whole area. Labour, so kilograms of milk sold per full-time equivalent, um, and the labour, the other one is cows, it shows the same if you did cows, I think it was 95 to 101 if you did cows per full-time equivalent. So the top 25% are getting more milk out of the same labour unit. And when they're purchasing feed on a cents per meg, so it's on the energy value, not the dollars per tonne, so they're not just buying some cheap shitty stuff, it's actually cents per meg, they're buying cheaper feed as well. Just before the curve goes off that, I mean, people looking at those pasture figures will obviously say, well, you know, WA, that seems a lot lower maybe than the red sky sort of information we had. We, we, we discussed it this morning, it's a bad calculation, so there's so many inputs to this, you know, in terms of how much grain is being fed. We certainly found in the first year there was a misallocation of grain. They, they don't have as much grain being fed to heifers in, in Victoria that we have over here, and that was cows being fed to the cows. We still believe that that feed is a bit rubbery for some people out there. So, you know, we're working with them to try and get that, but I suppose that, that emphasises again that when you're keeping a record of how much feed you make in terms of uh, silage or hay, where you feed it, which stock you feed it to, grain purchases, where you allocate that, really is critical we get that so that we can start to, I suppose, fine tune that, that pasture sort of figure for yourselves. Thanks John. However, there is a warning here. There is very little correlation between, so if I just looked at the stocking rate of the average versus the top 25%, there is very little correlation between that and return on assets. So these individually, have very little correlation to return on assets. The top 25 manage each one of them quite well. And I'll show you that with the, I went through the data and pulled it apart. So this is kilograms milk, milk solids per hectare. So basically that production, so stocking rate by um, solids per cow. 
there is, and then return on assets. So as you can see, as there is a positive correlation that there, as you increase your milk solids per hectare, you are getting a better return on asset. But the confidence level, so those that are familiar with confidence, if these all lined up on that line, you'd be 100% confident that there was a direct correlation between milk solids per hectare and return on assets. What this R squared means, because there is a scatter around it, and the wider that scatter, the lower this number, it basically says that you are 50% confident that there is a correlation between kilograms milk solids per hectare and return on asset. So that's like <coughs> flipping a coin and saying heads or tails. That was the strongest correlation. Most of them are down at 15 to 20%. So that's why I say individually, it's no use you grabbing your data set and saying, oh, I'm at 0.8 cows. If I go to 1.1, problem solved, it'll be in the top 21, top 25. It's all the little things adding up. Excuse me, I just have, have a question on the, the difference between irrigation and dry land. Yep. Like, when, when you're working out the top 25, are they split between the two, or, or is it skewed towards... No, there's a split. And there it is actually a split between size as well, herd size, which you won't see in that because we deliberately removed herd size out of it. But I can, if you, as long as you believe me, I can tell you that there's, herd size has got nothing to do with it either. So there wasn't, it wasn't like saying the large or small irrigated or dry land farmers are the best. There was a mixed bag and it comes down to perfect segue, Scott. What do they do? They manage all resources well. So the individual, it's exactly the same message that Martin presented after that, um, the flexible feeding system you know, with the partner farms. PMR against TMR, the system is not the winner. It's the person sitting in the seat driving that system. So it's the person's ability to utilize the resources they have and understand when they're driving those resources that are kicking the goals. So, as I said, the top 25% did produce more milk per hectare, but don't walk away and try and just drive milk per hectare if you're just pumping expensive feed into them because you'll be doing your, your shirts at the same time. They, do, they are more efficient with their labour efficiency, but again, don't just go focusing on that and driving that down at the expense of other things. These three together, if you worked on those three together, they're the things that usually stand out um, as the common trends in that top 25%. And in that top 25%, so the, the seven individuals that were there in 13, 14, five of them were there again in 14, 15. So they've actually repeated it the second year around. So they're the people that obviously you'd be confident, you know, as in, if you're thinking of it coming in as investment, earning 11% return on asset, they're the guys you'd happily give your money, or I'd happily give my money to. So understanding how they drive their system. Some points of interest that I found interesting, and I've, um, those that don't know, I have worked across beef, sheep, grains industry, the same sort of themes come through. We talk about price so much, but the milk price variation, yes, it, it is, I acknowledge it's there, it's 42 cents to 40, uh, 51 cents, but the variation there on something you've got no control on at all, 33%. All well, the variation you've got in variable costs and overhead costs, they are massive. They are controllables. So that's my big take home, control the controllables and drive those things that you can um, take hold of. And the break even price variation, and this is, I suppose, my, um, I suppose I'll be careful with my wording, uh, it's a personal view, is people squeal about, give me a better price in the market, but if they don't understand what price they actually need for their business to run, what's the point of squealing about it? The break-even price, which sits in your, if, in your book here, is, um, I think it's one of the most powerful ones if you haven't looked at it yet, Number 16, figure 16, and here it is. So the, here's the, the 29 participants and their break-even price. And it's in dollars per kilo milk solids, but if it was cents per litre, it'd be the exact same range. 
So what it shows is these cross-section ones are your top 25%. So they're the, the um, top 25% in terms of return on asset. The line, basically the top of the line is their break-even price and the actual dot is the price that they received. Now why I think this is so powerful is you've got say two here that have got are uh, sitting obviously very good in terms of business uh, financial efficiency at um, in the top 25 return on assets, but their break even price is over five bucks. It's about 550 here and 520 there. So quite a high um, break even price versus these two here, who have a very low, you know, at 350. These guys are making a lot of money here, so they're doing it well financially but they can also weather a storm. If there was, I mean, you could, um, Cam can touch on what's happening over in Victoria at the moment. If there was a sudden, and I don't think there will be, but if there was something dramatic, these guys can weather the storm. And you look at these other ones that are in here, they can actually weather the storm as well because they're quite low cost of production. So it's about not just, again, don't just focus on return on assets as well. It's about understanding how they all interlink and as you start to get each lever working in the right direction, those little incremental gains actually add up to these sort of two gains where you've got a robust system and making good margin. Make sense? These ones, the other way of looking at it out here, this guy has got the best milk price and yet he needs it. Or well, they need it, I should say. I don't know who it is. So the margin's pretty, they, they do, and if they can secure those you know, longer term contracts with high income, secure their income, the business is not at risk. If they can't secure that income, that's when the business starts to look a bit shaky. So here you're at, was that 680 versus, you know, most of these are around that sort of 450. And the average, the WA average was 450 or 35 cents a litre as the break even price.